Hello everyone, welcome back to the workshop. Uh, this is part three of our BSA Bantam Yamaha clutch conversion and um, there is going to be a part four. Um, I tried to condense it all into one video but there's just um, there's just too much footage and I don't want to cut it down because um, if you are following this along to do the conversion yourself you know I want it to be sufficient detail uh, for you to, um, to carry it out. So um, you won't have to wait long. Uh, today is Saturday uh, so part three we've got today and then hopefully I'll get all the editing done and we'll get part four out for uh, Sunday evening or uh, possibly Monday. So not long to wait really uh, to complete the series. Um, if you have been following this along and you've enjoyed it, uh, thanks very much. Um, it's been quite successful on YouTube. Uh, I've enjoyed seeing all the comments and, uh, and you know replying to you. Uh, but uh, if um, you've just found this video, then it is worth going back and watching uh, part one and two just to get the full story. Um, as ever, thanks very much indeed for watching. Uh, I very much appreciate it. Uh, thanks for subscribing. And um, you know, I hope that you're uh, enjoying the series and you're getting something from it. So um, let's get on and uh, do some work. Right, we're going to do some measuring and there's two things we're going to measure. First one, straightforward enough, is the overall height of the clutch because um, you'll recall that I took a measurement of the overall height of the clutch when we had this fitted, uh, when this was, you know, when the uh, original clutch was all assembled. And um, it's not going to help us a great deal, but it'll just give us a guide. Um, I think largely what the problem is with these clutches they're not a great deal longer, but they are larger in diameter, and that interferes with certain features on the inside of the clutch cover. And I think that by reducing the height, we get we get the clutch away from those features, and that's how we, we gain, gain our clearance. But hopefully we won't have to take too much off. But um, let me just find the page in the notebook where I wrote down the original one. Here we go. Uh, 57.6 was the original. So let's just see what we're on now. I'll zero this out. Helps if you turn it on. <laughs> zero it out against the table, um, and then we'll we'll take a take a reading. And I'm just going to hold it flat because I don't want it to rock. It's only mount. It's only sort of sitting on a um, fairly small surface area, and I felt that rock in my hands. So let's just do that again. There we go. So we're on 58, 58.58. So we're on 57.6 before we've gained just, a, uh, just under a millimetre, two tenths under a millimetre. So let's write that down, 58.57. Uh, and then I'm going to turn to a new page of my notebook where I've wrote thrust bearing deck height. And we'll do the thrust bearing deck height because our thrust bearing is sitting slightly lower than our um, the inside face of our clutch drum or clutch basket if you prefer uh, it's slightly subsurface and I want to know that value because um, I want some more clearance on my clutch hub I'm not happy with the clearance I think we're getting all the clearance that we're getting at the moment it's coming from this um, our splined insert and that's not um, that's given as a false indication. Um, once we tighten it up with the nut, we will we'll lose that and we'll end up clamped up solid, I think. So um, let's uh, let's figure this one out. Okay, I'm going to hold it again. Just lower it onto the deck. Zero it out, and then we'll move it onto the thrust bearing. I'm going to hold the thrust bearing as well because I don't want that to tip in any way. I want a nice accurate reading. That's nice and square. And I'm getting 1.01. We'll call that. Can we call that a millimeter? Can't we? Um, so a millimeter below the surface. Right. Okay. Switch this off because the battery says it's getting low. Get him out of the way. There we go. Right, so what to do about it then? Um, 
I don't want to add shims because I don't want loads of pieces. I don't want um, you know lots and lots of bits and pieces in this collection. Keep the keep the parts count down to a minimum. Um, so I think the best thing to do is to increase the thickness of um, the thrust bearing upper plate, and that will um, give us our clearance that we want. However, I have been thinking about this hub and. Um, this area here is aluminium and I don't particularly want um, aluminium running on a hardened steel um, thrust plate because even though this is designed to, to turn this and to run with it and there shouldn't be any um, it shouldn't be a faying surface there shouldn't be any fretting between the two you just never know you could get some slippage um, so I think we need steel on steel come off it won't come off there we go get back in there you so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to split the difference we've got one millimeter that we need to gain to get to zero to get to our deck height and then I think I'm going to add another millimeter so if I put one millimeter shim on here and use uh, a decent quality um, engineering structural adhesive will bond our shim to here one millimeters and we will add one millimeter to the thickness of our um, upper thrust plate and that will give us our two millimeter gain um, one millimeter to get us up to zero and one millimeter clearance and I think that should do it I think that should do it um, yeah so that's the plan um, let's do it upon the milling table and uh, the wiggler and he's not some evil super villain he is um, a fairly cheap and reasonably accurate way of picking up um, punch marks and spot marks and things like that um, comes with this needle um, and also a host of other um, accessories ball end um, pieces and cylindrical end pieces for indicating edges uh, but for indicating um, punch marks and the like you need this uh, needle end uh, component and as you can see it's going into our spot mark nicely I've spotted all six of our chain wheel rivet holes and we're going to drill them um, so yeah there you go it's not kicking off to the side um, basically it's like a pin chuck it's it's um, there's a ball end and it's free to move from side to side uh, so if you if we just knock him off center you see, oh, off he goes, like some medieval torture device, and then you just get in there with your with your spanner. Oh, he's off. Get it running as true as it will run. There we go. And as I say, if we were off centre, it would kick off, um, and then you'd move your table the corresponding amount until it didn't. So we're lined up on that one, ready to drill, and uh, we're going to drill through at four millimeters, which is our countersink size. Um, you'll see the countersinking tool, um, which I've got from my many years of aircraft sheet metal work. I've got a special tool, um, which some of you may have seen before and may not. Um, we'll see. I'll show you that in a bit. Um, but we're going to have to be careful because we haven't got a lot of land. And what I mean by land is um, the distance from the edge of the material to the center of the hole and um, for effective riveting it needs to be 2d really we haven't got 2d so we're going to be using 4.8 rivets um, so that would be like a 9.6 millimeter land and we haven't got that we've got about well i don't know let me have a measure let me have a measure because i've forgotten quite frankly yeah, we're, we're, we're near a six, so um, not ideal, but we'll be all right, as long as we're careful with the countersink. And that's why we're going to countersink it at four millimetres and then open out our um, hole size to the 4.8, because if we countersink at 4.8, we'd go off the edge of our material. We'd end up with too big a, a countersink. But um, we can get around it, which is good. So... Um, 
I'll get this switched off, get a drill bit in there, and uh, we will drill a hole. Okay, so our starting drill is 3.2, and then we'll go up to 4 mil. Uh, if you go up in increments, you generally get more accurate holes. And accuracy is definitely the name of the game on this one. Okay. Quite close to the um, work holding with the chuck, but we have got clearance. And clearance is clearance, as they say. So that's our 3.2. And then we'll go over to our four mil. Okay, doke. Alrighty, good stuff. I'm happy to be using my uh, milling machine. This job's great because it's got me on my milling machine. Right, um, I'm not going to put you through the pain of watching me do all six, so we'll be back at the bench when I'm done. Here we go then, automatic countersinking tool. And uh, excuse my voice being a bit croaky, um, we've got high pollen here today. And then uh, my allergies have decided to kick in early, so yeah, fantastic. Anyway, we'll soldier on, and we'll talk about this thing. Um, it's an aircraft sheet metal tool, and um, I've used it many, many times when I've been doing skin repairs on aircraft. And you, you get interchangeable heads, uh, interchangeable cutting heads with a different size pilot. Probably just about see the pilot under there. You know it's a pilot because it never stops going on about it. Um, anyway, you've got a micrometer scale on the side here, a uh, millimeter scale. And what you can do is you can wind this guide up and down the body of the tool and it will give you a different depth of cut and it's spring loaded. So every time you insert the tool, let me show you, every time you insert the tool into the job, it will go down and it will cut to whatever depth you've set the guide and when you've got it right by practice on a on a piece of um, on a piece of material that's the same thickness as what you're working on you can lock it off with this uh, threaded ring here and it's used primarily not on the machine it's primarily used in um, a pneumatic drill hand you know handheld drill um, and you work on the side of an aircraft and its function is to get all your countersinks exactly the same and therefore all your rivet depths exactly the same because if you do a panel on the side of an aircraft with say 800 rivets in it and all your countersinks are done you know by eye they won't be exactly the same and it will stand out like a sore thumb that some of the rivets are deeper set deeper than others and yeah what a mess so basically you use this tool to make sure that you get accurate repeatable uh, rivet countersinks. So there we go. As you can see there, let me try and zoom you in a little bit. You may just have to stop the camera and restart it. One second. Right, we're back. There you go. There's your countersink. Nice and uniform. And um, I'll get set up for the next one. And uh, I'll show you the tool in action. And um, you'll get to see what it does. But you don't need one of these. To do this job um, if you've got a set of countersinks in your toolkit you can just set your milling machine depth stopper um, i used a bit of this six millimeter plate that i've been using for the fixtures i just used that to practice on and get my countersink depth right you do exactly the same get your countersink uh, depth right on a piece of scrap and then set your depth stop up on your milling machine um, but i wanted to show you this tool because this is my countersinking tool um, I haven't got a set of um, open countersinks, although you can take these guides off and use them. You can screw them right off and use this thing um, blind if you want to. But um, 
I just thought it'd be interesting for you. Anyway, let's get set up and do another one. Right, we're set up to go, and uh, I've got you zoomed in onto the business end of the job. And uh, there we go. You can see the tool entering the work and all that jazz. So, um, all that remains is to do do a countersink. So as you see, the guide stops turning. And we start munching. And basically, once it gets to the limit of its travel, you don't get any more any more chips. And that's it. Job done. Nice uniform countersink. Make sure we're all the way. We are, we're just getting sort of dust at the end really as it, as it just polishes because it can't cut anymore so there you go i'll just um, give that a little toot with the airline there we go two uniform countersinks and there's been many things on this job it's just a rinse and repeat and um we'll uh we'll come back once it's done Okay, uh, we're at that stage of the game now where we need to lock our new splined um, insert against rotation in our uh, clutch hub. And um, one of my viewers, Ian, guessed it right. Um, Ian has a YouTube channel called In The Shed. And in Ian's shed, he uh, works on all manner of uh, motorbikes. Um, quite a... Quite a um, few British bikes he works on, um, BSAs, so that's where my interest comes in, but he's also just recently done a Honda as well, a classic Honda, and um, the great thing about Ian's channel is he doesn't wrap it on like I do, he gets straight into it and straight down to the point, so um, I'm sure it'll be along in the comments, um, but um, get over there and have a look at his channel, see what you think, I think you'll find something that you like. Now, what was it that Ian got right? Well, he said, he said, I think you're going to drill it on the join line between the um, insert and the hub, and I think you're going to insert a pin. And he's absolutely right. That is exactly what we're going to try and do. Um, and we have these DIN7 um, 3 millimeter by 10 millimeter dowel pins, and we have the drill and reamer three millimeters and um, we're gonna have a bit of a go at it now I hope you're getting a decent view there um, looks a little bit out of focus I'm gonna probably try and focus you in a little bit more before we continue just bear with me there we go that's a little bit of a sharper image so yeah that's the plan drill on the center line uh, the join line rather between the insert and the hub and try and put a pin in there now regrets Mm, not really, but I do wish I'd left an extra millimetre or so on the insert. I was concerned about um, boring into the limiting features on the other side of the hub, but I think I could probably have afforded myself another millimetre, or maybe even a millimetre and a half, which would have probably made this job a bit easier. But we are where we are. Um, if we make a mess of it, we'll just have to do it again. But... Um, Here's to not making a mess of it. Here we go. So first I'm just going to have a little bit of a peck with this centre drill. Just to get a start. Uh, before we go in there with the big guns of the, um, the drill bit and the reamer. The audio is probably fluctuating a little bit because I'm getting closer to the camera as I'm... Um, crane in my neck to see what I'm doing. And we're getting a bit close to the edge here with this uh, centre drill. I'm just trying to think if I've got a set of spot drills. I have got a set of spot drills, but I've got one the right size. 
now that we've got that in there, it might be um, it might be worthwhile seeking out a spot drill. We just uh, we've got any air? Oh, we haven't got any air. <laughs> oh dearie me! What a catalogue of disasters! Right, I'm going to see if I can dig out a, um, a spot drill, and then I will get some air on the go as well. So I'll be right back. Well, the answer was no, I didn't have a spot drill that small. However, um, we're just going to have to carry on, I think. Uh, I've got the drill bit in there now, the reaming drill bit, which is 2.9, I think, or 2.84. And I'm just going to get in there with a bit of real coal, RTD paste, to give us a fighting chance of not breaking it. And then we're just going to have to see what we can do. Um, We've got some air now so we can keep the thing clean and, and see what we're doing. Don't drop the brush on the floor, Dean, that's a bad idea. There we go. Um, so yeah, just up the RPMs a little bit and um, hope for the best. Here we go. Well, it's cutting. I'm feeding with the quill um, simply because it's probably the most um, the most sensitive feel that I've got on this machine. I thought about using the fine feed, but you're completely remote from from the drill bit when you're using that, it's more for putting cuts on when you're milling, you know, getting nice, um, nice precise cuts. And then obviously if I feed with the knee, um, with the drill bit this small, you, you, know, you won't be able to feel anything at all. Well, that seems to be working anyway. Well, we seem to be getting somewhere with that, I think. Um, I don't know how interesting it is for you guys watching me drill a hole. So maybe I'll bring you back when we're a bit further on. And then we'll just sit here with clenched buttocks, hoping that this thing doesn't snap off and uh, keep going at it. Well, caution prevailed, and um, we're all the way through, which is good news. Um, I was using Rollcall to start with, which is um, a great product. That's what it looks like. Very soapy uh, material. It's great for, um, for keeping the tool cool. The only problem with it is, for depth drilling, um, it doesn't always get to where you want it to be. You can thin it down with cutting oil. Uh, which makes a, a quite a, a good all-round lubricant but um, I just switched to Supercut just so that we could flood the hole with it once we got some depth in there we could flood the hole with it and it kept the tip 
uh, nice and cool. Did have a couple of twitchy moments where it started making some some noises, but thankfully uh, it didn't wrench the tip off the drill and uh, we got through. So I will get the reamer set up, we'll ream the hole and then we'll dismantle all this from the milling machine and um, have a look at what we've got. Um, I will show you the setup before I dismantle it just in case you want to replicate this and do the same. Um, and I do keep going about milling machine this and milling machine that, um, we're just using it as a drill press. So if you've got a lathe and a drill press in your workshop, um, I can't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to do all of the operations that I've done. Um, I haven't got a drill press, I haven't got room in here for another um, upright machine, so I just used a VMC as a drill press. But um, there we go. Right, let me get swapped out for the reamer and um, we'll have a go at doing some reamer. Okay, reamer is in play and um, I filled up the hole with supercut and I've put some row coal on the reamer as well. So a double bubble, we should be all right. And we're just going to take it nice and steady. What a nice accurate hole. And we don't want to break the reamer. Otherwise the reamer will be our method of locking. No, I'm only kidding. I wouldn't do that. Oh, the wind's getting up. Okay, we should be good. We've got a hole, we've reamed it out, and uh, we just need to fit a pin. So, um, that noise you heard was a light moving around. I'm trying to get you enough light to see, and uh, I had a light hanging off the um, off the quill, no, the quill handle rather. Um, shining on the job. I need to get a machine light on here so that I can see properly. Right, um, let me move the camera back and uh, we'll have a look at the setup. Right, that's the setup I've been using. Um, I've got the fixture plate that I used for turning in the lathe with the, um, the clutch hub um, screwed to it, screwed through the other side using the clutch spring screws again. And then I've got this old bearing race uh, De Havilland or Hawker Sidley, but other ones will do, uh, whatever you've got. And um, a couple of toe clamps either side, clamping the plate um, basically via the bearing to the bed. So um, the only thing holding the clutch hub is the screws holding it to the fixture plate. So there's nothing directly bearing on this um, causing uh, any distortion. So that's what I used. And um, yeah, I'm sure you'll be able to cobble something very similar together. And obviously, a nice cup of tea as well to celebrate the job. And um, we'll get it dismantled. Right, the shot's a little bit bleary um, because there's not much light at this end of the workshop. Uh, but um, we're over at the press. We've got the pin just started in the hole. I've got some Loctite, uh, same Loctite I was using before, the 601 high strength retainer and uh, I'm going to attempt to not be completely in the way as we push the pin in. Uh, don't know if this is going to work or not. Well it's going to work, it's just whether or not I'll have to have something a little bit more solid underneath the uh, hub. We just have a socket at the moment. I'm sure we'll uh, we'll manage. It's all a bit. It's a bit tight, really getting. Ah, oh, there we go. That's going. 
we just um, I need to release the pressure a little bit because we'll get stuck on the edge if we don't. There we go. Oh, it's just starting to tilt. Well, let's get the pressure off quick. Are we all the way down? We're all the way down anyway. So there we go. The pin is locked tighted in and pressed in and it's all the way through to the other side and uh, as you can see it's locked tight everywhere. I try and keep it out of the splines because it's uh, a real pain to get out of splines but um, are you seeing that? Am I just waving this around in fresh air? No, yes I am. Right, there you go. So as you can see, pin is all the way through on that side and it's flush on that side. So I think that our splined insert is going nowhere. Um, certainly not going to fall out because it's loctited and pressed into the hub. Um, and it's basically in a sandwich situation when it is fitted on the engine. And uh, also, it's not going to rotate uh, because of the pin. So, there we go. Winner, winner. Chicken dinner. So, I'm just going to get some methylated spirits now. I know you can't see me. I'm behind you. Um, get some methylated spirits, just get all that excessive Loctite off. Because as I say, if it gets into your splines and um, manages to dry, yeah, not great. Not a great way of doing things. Where are we? There we go. And I would call that a good engineering solution because we've used a sort of um, international standard really, the DIN pin. It's a, um, an approved and internationally recognized technique that we've used. We've used standard parts and um, yeah, why reinvent the wheel when somebody's already introduced a set of standards that you can use and you can adopt for your job just work you know existing standards into your design and um, they will work because that's how they become international standards so there we go happy with that bit okay um, I wanted to share some progress with you um, that I've made off camera and my reasons uh, for doing that are it's not really work that needed demonstrating. It's fairly straightforward, and I'm conscious of the fact that I'm, you know, adding time to the video, and I want you to enjoy it, and also um, I want to be able to upload it to YouTube. So, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of not letting it run on too long. Um, so, let's have a look at what I've been doing. Um, we talked about the bonded shim uh, that I wanted to use, um, as this is aluminium. Um, and we were going to have the bearing upper plate running on the surface, well on the aluminium surface. I was a bit concerned that we would probably get some fretting and um, you know we're going to get some wear on this surface. So what I wanted to do was replicate the surface of the original um, hub, the BSA hub. Um, so that's what we've done. Um, we've got a 0.8 millimeter shim bonded to the aluminium. This is a um, good quality material. It's EN24 uh, 35NC6. So it's you know a good hard material and um, I think it will serve us quite well. Um, this is what I bonded it with. This is my go-to metal to metal um, adhesive Loctite 307 and um, it's an anaerobic adhesive and it you can use it as a one part adhesive um, but it takes a little bit longer to cure uh, so what I do is I use an activator which is this stuff here if I can get that to focus and possibly not it's 7471 anyway that's an aerosol activator and um, you spray one side with the activator you spray uh, sorry you apply the adhesive to the other side press them firmly together you know, move it around a bit to get a good even dissipation 
and then apply a little bit of load. I used a socket and a, um, a heavy V-block and I just left it overnight and it sets like steel. Um, it's good stuff. Um, it's designed for the job basically. Um, you don't have to use this. Um, you can use a two-part epoxy, I would think. Um, whatever your sort of favorite um, metal to metal bond is, um, all we're trying to do is stop this from rotating and um, you know whatever you've got in your workshop um, I'm sure will be just fine. Well we suffered a flat battery uh, we're back with a fresh charge now. We've talked about the bonded shim so the next thing to talk about is the bearing. Um, I did haver a little bit on this job I thought is it the right thing to do making a new thrust plate should I just add an extra shim but I don't want extraneous parts really if I can help it so um, I made the thrust plate so we've added a millimeter uh, and if you can see that very well you can see the thickness there's the original so we've added a millimeter and that gives us our, our deck height in there um, I haven't got a surface grinder so um, I stoned it to get a nice flat finish after I turned it so um, again EN24 35 NC6 uh, good hard material um, and I don't think it's going to give us any problems. Um, I don't think the bearings wear out particularly often. So if we do have to change the bearing at some point, um, you know, we could always just give it a quick stone over again to remove any brindling marks. But what's the betting? This is the original bearing, and that engine's on second oversize. So you know, I'd be happy to put this back. I will get a new one, but I'll be honest with you, there's nothing wrong with it. So there you go. Um, thicker thrust plate. Um, so our bearing is now a little bit wider so when we put it in the um, into the clutch drum we've got the deck height that we wanted and with the addition of our 0.8 shim we've got uh, we've got adequate clearance so that's good news um, I made the nut um, the shouldered nut because there's a, a recess here you can see that there's some depth there um, in our hub and um, so it's got a shoulder that corresponds with that recess uh, and has adequate clearance for a tab washer I made this from a piece of EN1 hex bar 13 um, AF which is the original uh, BSA size and um, it's half inch BSF uh, thread um, for anybody that, that, uh, that wants to make one uh, I like this EN1 it's quite good for making nuts it's quite a ductile material um, but the specs say that it's got fairly decent tensile strength as well, which, you know, is neither here nor there really. It's perfectly adequate um, for making a nut, and it turns really well. You get a nice finish with it. So, yeah, that's that bit done. Um, obviously, um, you will have to measure, when you do this conversion, you'll have to measure the depth to correspond with the depth of your um, recess, and then allow for whatever tab washer you're going to use. I'm going to get... Um, a new Yamaha one which will fit the clutch um, and I'm going to bore it out to half inch so I'll order one of those from Yamaha when we build the engine and we can use uh, the original tab washer so that'll be great so that's pretty much it really that's all I've done off camera That's you've not really missed out on anything um, nothing that um, that needed demonstrating anyway so the next job I think is to shorten down um, these clutch fingers because you'll recall it won't fit inside the casing as it is uh, because of the diameter um, it, um, it's um, fouling so we need to reduce the length of these fingers um, so we need to come up with a way of finding out how much to take off so that will be the next job right well that's the first time we're seeing the clutch kind of how it's going to be um, I've got it loosely assembled. Well, when I say loosely assembled, the center nut is tightened up. The springs are tightened up properly. Um, I've got a push rod fitted, um, which I'll show you uh, in a short while. Uh, push rod fitted through the center. And I've slaved the D7 clutch cable onto, um, onto this engine. And this is sitting on my workshop stool next to the D7. It's all a bit uh, Mr. Heath and Mr. Robinson, but 
there's method, I promise you there's method. Um, what I want to do is operate the clutch and I'll have to hold on to the clutch um, drum because it isn't riveted yet. And the reason why it isn't riveted yet is because I'm going to have to take it apart again to cut these fingers down to shorten them. So what I want to do is I want to disengage the clutch and mark the furthest extremity that the last friction plate moves to. And then I know that I won't cut past there and I won't run the risk of having my friction plate floating around in fresh air. So that's what I'm going to do. So you'll get to see the clutch move for the first time. Oh, you'll also get to see the camera move when I kick the tripod. Sorry about that. But here we go. So I'm going to hold on to the basket or drum or whatever it is you'd like to call it. I'm going to push it. Well, I can't really do that. I'm going to have to do it like this. You have to excuse fingers for a second. I'm going to push that hard up against the chain wheel. <laughs> There's no pencil lead. Oh dear. There we go. I've made a mark. I'm going to rub it out because it's not in the right place. Let me make another mark. Okay. So we've now got a pencil mark, which is there. And hopefully, you can see that that's how far the clutch operates. So I need to dismantle everything again now. And I need to um, mark off a little bit of clearance. And then we need to cut these fingers down. So that'll be the next job. Okay, so we are reducing down the fingers on the clutch. Um, this is one of them processes where you've just got to be a bit brave, really. It's a little bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> a bit twitchy, but, you know, you've got to do it. You've spent a lot of time on this, um, this clutch drum so far, and it's just a little bit, you know, counterintuitive to start chopping it up. But that's what we've got to do. I've hacksawed most of the material off already. Um, I actually did it whilst it was mounted in the lathe chuck, because it just made things so much easier. Put the lathe board in and just, just cut through. Um, and now we're, we're advancing sort of two tenths at a time. Two tenths of a millimetre, that is, um, to reduce it down to uh, the desired depth. And I've got the hard stop set on the lathe so that we don't go any further than we um, need to. Um, I'm advancing on the cross slide. I'm using the travel dial to dial in my cut. And as you can see, I've just got it fairly lightly gripped um, in the center there on the three jaw chuck. So there you go. Let's, um, let's take the cut. Obviously, it's quite an interrupted cut. Be individual segments, but um, as long as we don't go bananas, we should be all right. I did think about milling these things, but it's quite a bit to take off. I just thought, well, you know what? It's round. Let's do it in the lathe. Sounds like an old fashioned telephone bag. Right, I'll do one more with you watching, and then uh, I will uh, switch the camera off, save a few minutes on the video, and uh, oh, drop the spanner in the swarm tray. Not a good idea. Let's have a look at the travel dial. So dial in another two tenths of a millimetre. Long carriage off. Go at it.
right, I'll carry on with this and I'll see you shortly. That's it, we're done. We are down to the line. The line is the scribe line is just barely visible right on the edge of um, the material. So we are we're good. And uh, it's machined really nicely. Yeah, it's a bit sharp. Obviously, it needs to you know, the flash over with the files to uh, remove the edges. But um, yeah, happy with that. Let's just hope it fits. Well, so far so good. Um, the amount of clearance that we measured for the clutch to clear is there. Just it's going to be right on the edge. But um, as long as you know, as long as these tangs stay engaged, um, it will work absolutely fine. Um, big question is, will it fit inside the casings? Um, basically, have my measurements been accurate? So that will be the next uh, acid test. Right, the moment of truth. Let's see if it's touching. Um, I've blued up the inside of the casing. So if we get any, um, any interference between the clutch and the casing, um, we should get a witness mark. Um, we might get something from the primary chain because the primary chain is quite slack um, and they're well known to touch the casings on these things when they are worn. Um, but as I say, the primary chain is just a, well, basically it's an old one. We'll give it a few, a few rotations. Ooh! Dear me. Uh, we'll give it a few rotations and um, have a look. I didn't feel any interference at all when the um, cover was going on. Oops, oh, that's probably enough, don't you? And um, like I say, no interference with the cover was going on and I couldn't feel anything or hear anything there. So let me whip the cover off and we will have a peek inside. Right, cover's off and um, I can't see anything at all. Um, no shiny silver lines in there. Get it into shot. There's some gouging already in here um, from the original clutch um, what happens is the um, the clutch bushings wear and um, the clutch starts to run eccentrically and it rubs against the casing it's a quite a well-known um, bantam fault another well-known bantam fault here you've got these gouges here from the primary chain and along there as well I don't know if you can see that because of the shadow over there you can just see it and you'll get it the other side as well yeah there we go here and that's from a slack primary chain there's no tensioner you can actually fit an aftermarket tensioner I think the trials guys when they change the um, front sprockets they end up with a load of slack in the primary chain and they fit a tensioner so that might be a little make for us that might be something for us to do later on but um, I think we're onto a winner with this clutch I really do can't see anything at all and I couldn't hear anything so yeah always a good um, good start so right I need to take it all apart again give it a really good clean up it's covered in marker dye and stuff from me marking it out um, you could shave with these edges so I'm gonna put a nice chamfer on them uh, deburr everywhere and then we'll be up for some riveting I think